three. But I welcome my Vice Chair, Senator Mimi Walters, Senator Sharon Runner, and Senator Bill Emerson, and would ask uh, the other members to uh, come over as soon as possible. Uh, Assembly Member Hagman is here. Uh, his second item on the file will begin as a subcommittee. And as soon as we have a quorum, uh, Mr. Hagman will call the roll, but we don't have one yet. Uh, so members will go to AB 135. And uh, whenever you're ready, Mr. Hagman, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, good morning. I'm here to present AB 135 that keeps a person with small business experience on the California Air Resource Board. They do not have to be current owner but only a pass, uh, as a past legislation has asked, simply within the last five years we are becoming on the board. This has no fiscal impact whatsoever, does not add a member to the board. This board would not change in any way, as it is right now. People are concerned about the logistics with the um, appointing a new member or, or replacing a member. We have taken the amendments by both the Assembly and Senate policy committees to ensure the governor isn't restricted. The appointment can be a doctor with his own practice or a green energy business owner. Currently, several small business owners are on CARB and we only want to make sure that stays this way in the future. Small business are the biggest stakeholders affected by CARB regulations, therefore allowing one seat on this board to be a uh, fitted part would be uh, not, um, would be necessary to hopefully get the, the vision to the businesses that we are here on the right track. Again, this has no cost to state, unlike another bill in this committee dealing with CARB, this measure does not change the makeup of the board by adding additional members or creating costs. AB 135 also has a sunset to acknowledge the importance of small business representation now, that sunset five years from now, and it allows the economy to hopefully recover here. I have two witnesses, Madam Thank Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hagman, but before, before we, uh, could we just call the roll, since we have a quorum now, uh, the Secretary will call the roll, and then we'll go right back. Kehoe? Here. Kehoe here. Walters? Here. Walters here. Alquist? Here. Alquist here. Emerson? Emerson here. Liu? Pavley? Price? Runner? Here. Runner here. Steinberg? <laughs> And that is uh, five uh, members. We have a quorum. Uh, Senator Walters. Uh, I just want to move the bill. Uh, uh, Senator Walters moves the bill. We'll go to your witnesses and then we'll hear from finance. Thank you, Chair and members. Good morning. Uh, Ken DeVore with the National Federation of Independent Business. Uh, we're the sponsors of this bill. Small business accounts for 99.2% of all the business in the state. And uh, they're the economic generate drivers, uh, creators of jobs, two thirds of all the jobs being created in the state right now. And uh, that's why this bill is uh, so fiscally important. Um, there are no costs associated. I know that uh, some have stated that there are currently a small business represent, there's, there is currently small business representation on the board and that's true. And we would just like to codify that and make sure that that uh, stays the same there. Very good. Next, Thank sir. You. Uh, good morning. Good my morning. name's uh, Jeff Pardini. Uh, we own two lumberyard home centers in uh, Grass Valley, California. I'm a fourth generation Californian. We've been in business since 1921. Uh, both Congratulations. Are Thank you. Yeah. And uh, hopefully, we'll, hopefully we'll keep going. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, we have uh, currently solar on both our stores and one of our stores has geothermal. Both have high efficiency lighting. Uh, I guess my point is, is just that this. Anytime I've made a decision without checking, like let's say purchasing a new truck or a new forklift, without checking with everybody in the business from the guy that builds the loads to the guy that delivers the uh, loads to our customers, uh, I've made an okay decision, but I could have made a better decision hearing all the people that are involved in the in, in the process. And all I'm saying is I think small business, there's some people out there that have some pretty good ideas and I think it would be great to uh, be able to hear from that aspect of the business because they are gonna be affected by these, by these laws. So um, that's my point. I just think that uh, we can come up with a good solution with everybody involved. Thank, Thank you. you. Good. Madam Next Chair, please. Chris McKaylee, on behalf of the California Grocers Association, many of whom are small businesses and many of whom have interactions with CARB. Thank you. Thank you. Any other testimony in favor, in favor of the bill? Is there opposition? Finance, do you have a comment on this? 
Madam Chair, we, John Lloyd, Department of Finance. We haven't identified any costs associated with the bill, but we do note that there is uh, representation on the uh, CARB currently by small business, and that um, through the Office of the Ombudsman and the uh, Office of Administrative Procedures Act, there is access to the rulemaking process for anyone. For those reasons, we are opposed to the bill. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a motion by uh, Senator Walters, and uh, I'll take comments from the members. I just uh, want to let Mr. Hagman know I'm not going to support the bill this morning. We've talked about it before, and I heard it in committee, as you remember. Um, we have small business representation on uh, the Air Resources Board. In fact, the San Diego County member, uh, Supervisor Ron Roberts, uh, is a professional architect and ran a business and uh, practiced himself. Uh, so um, he's one of uh, s some of the small business members, as the author pointed out. Uh, but is there any other comments? Uh, uh, Senator Alquist. Thank you. Just to say, I'm not sure what I'm going to do on, on the bill. I have voted no on this bill in the past, uh, twice actually. And uh, some of the concerns are that uh, small business is already represented. But even more than that, which I think is also very important, is that the, the law requires backgrounds for members in certain areas, which I believe is very, very important. And so my thinking is just, you know, it, it seems to be working the way that it is. Small business is represented, so I'm just not sure what I'm going to do. If, if I may, res may respond, Madam Chair, I totally sure. agree with you. If this board stayed the way it is for the next five years, this bill probably would not be necessary. We have a new governor, new administration. Right now, the economy for California is the most important thing for all of us, to, especially the show to let it appear to the businesses who are trying to think whether they're going to invest back here in California or not, whether they're going to grow jobs here in California. They want a signal from this capital that this is important. You don't have any other boards. You don't have a CMA board about doctors on it, a dentistry board about dentists on it. This is a regulatory body that regulates small business or businesses in California. And not to stay at least one member should have some business background, I think is how they problematic. If, you, if the governor does change, doesn't change anybody, we're okay. But we just saw what, this last week, three of the members of the water board being adjusted. We need that bipartisan spirit on these commissions. We need that perspective on this commission. I would urge your eye vote. Thank you, Mr. Hagman. Any other comments, members? We have a motion by Senator Walters. Please call the roll. Kehoe? No. Kehoe? No. Walters? Aye. Walters, aye. Alquist? Emerson? Emerson, aye. Lou? Pavley, Price, Runner, aye. Runner, I, Steinberg. Three, one, uh, Mr. Hagman, I'll keep it open because the members are still coming in. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, authors in the front row, Ms. Brownlee. And this is AB 250. Correct. Uh, go, and this is a suspense candidate, Ms. Brownlee, uh, but go ahead whenever you're ready. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair uh, and members. AB 250 takes some first steps in integrating the recently adopted Common Core content standards into our education system. Specifically, AB 250 requires the development of curriculum frameworks and professional development opportunities that are aligned to the Common Core standards. Fully aware of the uh, fiscal challenges, however, I believe we have an obligation to move forward and lay the groundwork for a thoughtful implementation of these standards. The good news is that the recently enacted budget included three and a half million dollars to support initial implementation of the Common Core standards uh, pursuant to legislation, and AB 250 is one of the three pieces of legislation moving through the process to implement the new content standards. Standards. The intent is for this bill to be funded through Title I uh, carryover funds and other existing funds available to the Department of Education. I will be submitting amendments to this effect while the bill is pending uh, in the suspense file. With regards to the STAR program extension costs, I just wanted to note that these are ongoing costs of the state assessment system that will be incurred, I think, with or without uh, this bill. I ask for your favorable consideration of this bill. Thank you, Ms. Brownlee. Let's go to your witnesses. Welcome. 
Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. Janice Ward in Washington on behalf of the sponsor of the bill, the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tom Torlakson. And Assemblymember Brownlee has summed up the bill and the intent with the costs, and we continue to work with your staff on the way that the bill will be funded. I have with me Dr. Tom Adams, who's the Director of the Standards, Curriculum, Frameworks, and Instructional Resources Division at the Department to answer any technical questions. Thank you. Uh, next, please. Uh, Dale Shimonsaki with the Association of American Publishers. We are in support of the measure that, and particularly the provisions that relate to instructional materials. Thank you. Next, please. All righty. Guess he's not saying anything. Uh, any other uh, testimony in favor? In favor. Is there opposition testimony? Uh, I'm going to go to finance. Uh, this is a suspense candidate, so I don't need a motion. But Ms. Brownlee and to the other authors, our, our deadline for amendments was last Thursday noon, I believe. Is that correct? Wednesday, Wednesday noon. Okay, I was giving you a day of grace. Uh, and w although we're happy to work with any member under any circumstances uh, at all times, uh, at this point, uh, it would be very, very difficult to uh, get mem um, amendments into the bills. And there are other uh, amendments, I understand, that are coming down on different bills. Same message to each author. Last week your, uh, uh, was the deadline. Your office was informed by letter. And we're not going to hear any comments about it. You can talk to staff if you've got some more <laughs> information for us. But I doubt you're going to persuade me. And uh, so we'll... we'll you know, of course, we'll take a look at them, but we're past deadline for amendments. Finance, do you have a comment on this? I have a uh, preliminary analysis that indicates that the cost would be in the millions of dollars. I don't have a position. All righty. We will talk about it, uh, Ms. Uh, Brownlee, while it's on suspense. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Mr. Solario? So, Thank you, Mr. Solario. Appreciate your waiting. Uh, this is the Displaced Janitor Opportunity Act, uh, AB 350 members. Uh, this is a, a due pass as amended after we hear uh, testimony. Go ahead, Mr. Solario. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senators. This bill expands the current Displaced Janitor Opportunity Act, which was established in 2001 to provide stability to workers who maintain and secure properties. Current law has been working quite smoothly for both employers and employees. Uh, specifically, this bill applies to property service contractors who employ 25 employees or more and requires workers to provide building maintenance such as licensed security, food cafeteria, and janitorial services to be retained by a successor contractor. Unlike workers in the professional setting or unlike workers here in the legislature, uh, property service workers can lose their jobs with little or no notice when the property manager decides to award the service to another contractor. California, as you know, continues to face record high unemployment levels, uh, still in excess of 12% in many communities, and the economy is not expected to rebound anytime soon. This bill affords a measure of job stability for low-wage workers when contractors are changed. At the same time, workers who have maintained and secured business properties know the facility and can provide better transition for the new contractor. This bill should not pose any cost to the state, as indicated in the analysis, as the bill grants a great amount of flexibility for successor contractors, allowing them to determine how many workers they need. So if they need less workers, they can hire less workers. Uh, they can retain those only with good job performance. And very importantly, if they feel they also need to pay workers less or have less benefits for the new workers, that is allowed. And then after the retention period, which uh, we're amending to decrease back to the 60 days as in current statute, uh, employment shall be at will, uh, under which the employee may be terminated without cause, 
As the analysis states, the costs are minor and do not impact the general fund. Thank you, and I ask for your I vote. Thank you, Mr. Solario. Next, please. Good morning. My name is Andrew Gross Gaetan. I work for SEIU, United Service Workers West. We represent approximately 40,000 low wage property service workers in the right. private sector in California. So you need to. Um, Summarize this. We have we have the copy in writing. I have so a shorter, very very briefly, the fiscal issues version. only. Um, excuse me. I think what I'd like to jump to then is that we we've seen a lot the about the points. bill in the media. The material the papers have chosen to reprint reprint indicates a real failure to check facts, either by reading the bill or by reviewing relevant state or federal law. AB 350 does not cover landscapers, engineers, or any other service workers that the author did not mention. AB 350 does not require a 90-day retention period at 60 days. It does not force automatic union recognition, which has been one of the major issues in the, in the media. It does not force retention of existing wages, benefits, or staffing levels. It does not require new companies to hire workers with demonstrated performance issues. It's hard to imagine how a bill that keeps workers in their jobs can even be called a job killer. All we can really include is, conclude is you shouldn't believe everything you read in the paper. We do have a couple of members from the industry who are going to speak, and I think what they will speak to is the bill provides California's working poor an opportunity to prove themselves to their new employer rather than find themselves and their families on the street without warning. Protecting the most vulnerable workers and stabilizing employment are absolutely essential economic priorities for lifting California out of the deep recession we face today. We ask for your vote to support AB 350 and the working families it seeks to protect. Alfredo Herrera has yeah, we'll go to your next words witness. Good morning. Okay. Buenos días. Uh, mi nombre es Alfredo Herrera. He trabajado como janitor en el centro de Sacramento durante siete años. My name is Alfredo Herrera. I've worked as a janitor in downtown Sacramento for seven years. En los siete años, el edificio en el que he trabajado ha cambiado dos veces el contrato de limpieza. During those seven years, my, the building where I work has changed contractors twice. Cuando el edificio cambió las empresas de limpieza, yo sabía que trabajando responsablemente no perdería mi empleo. When the building changed contractors, I knew that if I was working responsibly, I would not lose my job. Sabía que tenía que quedarme la oportunidad de probarme de que la compañía me contrataría. I knew that I would have the opportunity to prove myself to the new company that would contract me. Debido a la SB20, empleados que trabajamos dedicados, tuvimos la oportunidad de mantener nuestros puestos de trabajo. Thanks to the existing law, and to our own hard work, we were able to keep our jobs. Algunos podrán decir que mantienen a los trabajadores flojos, también que, pero eso es simplemente erróneo. Some people may say this protects the, the lazy workers, but that's just erroneous. Cuando la empresa de limpieza cambió y fueron capaces de dejar a los trabajadores de limpieza que no estaban haciendo bien su trabajo. Because when the companies changed in my building, the new company was able to not to hire the people who had problems with their cleaning work. Okay. AB uh, 350 haría lo mismo para los oficiales de seguridad y trabajadores de servicios y alimentos. AB 350 would do the same for security officers and food service workers. Por favor, apoye AB 350 y ayudar a dar a otros la posibilidad de que SB 20 me ha dado a mí. Please support AB 350 and, and give the opportunity to others that has been given to me. And we'll, thank you, sir. We'll go to the next thank speaker. You. Hi, good morning. My name is Kevin Adams. I've been a security officer for 21 years. Um, I worked for a company one time where they lost the contract. And because they lost the contract, I was left unemployed. I was at work and was waiting for my relief. I, um, an officer from another company came in, identified himself and said that he was there to relieve me of duty. I contacted my company. They had no information to give to me. Two hours later, I received a phone call to pack up. They had lost the contract. Because of this, I was left unemployed and unable to provide for myself. I'm here today to support AB 350 because it would provide opportunity for officers to prove themselves to the incoming contractor. How long were you unemployed as a result of being let go like that? 
five weeks. Five weeks. So did you get hired by another security company? Yes. So you were a good performing security yes, guard? Yes, ma'am. Okay. A anything else you want to add? I hope you support it as well as I do. I, I knew that part. <laughs> um, any other speakers in favor, please? And we'll need those three chairs, unless we need a translator. Come on up. I know. And we'll need all three chairs, please. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Madam Chair, members, Caitlin Vega for the California Labor Federation. We think that this bill makes sense and that it allows workers to essentially audition to keep their jobs. They get a chance to show that they can do the work, that they can please the new contractor, rather than having all of their economic security tied up in something that they have no control over, which is uh, which company has that contract. So we think that this is a bill that imposes minimal state costs and really provides workers with a little bit of economic security, at least a transition period um, during these times that are so hard for all working families. So we'd urge your I vote. Thank you. Additional testimony in favor. Any more in favor? Then we'll go to opposition testimony. Come on up, please, and then we'll hear from finance and members if there's any comments. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. Jennifer Barrera on behalf of the California Chamber of Commerce, and we're strongly opposed to this bill and have labeled it as a job killer. This bill interferes with an employer's fundamental right to manage their workforce. It forces them to hire employees that they have no ability to conduct a background check on. They have no ability to do a drug test on them. They have to take these employees, regardless of who they are, uh, without knowing them and without even having a chance to interview them. Um, the only the only exception to that in the bill is for cause as defined as poor performance with the prior employer, which is never going to happen. Uh, poor performance, the prior employer has no incentive to notify a subsequent employer that an employee is performing badly because it's their opportunity to rid themselves of a poor performing employee. And plus we have strong defamation laws here in California that would jeopardize a risk of litigation if a prior employer was ever going to say something negative about the employees. So it is a mandate on private employers to hire these employees. And it doesn't help unemployment. Uh, at best, we say it's a break even because if you have to hire on these employees, you're either one, going to displace existing employees that you already have, or two, you're not going to be offering up these jobs to other people in the same industry that would have had an opportunity to interview and compete for these jobs. So it is a disadvantage. It's the government basically coming in and saying for a very small group of people, we're going to provide you with security, but for other employees in the very same industry, you're at a disadvantage, which we don't think that the government government should be doing. Number three, it's going to have a huge impact on employers' costs. Uh, when you have to bring on these additional employees, there's additional costs for that. If you have to let them go at the end of 60 days because they are a poor performer, then that subsequent contractor is tagged for the unemployment claims that should have been uh, borne by the prior contractor. You run the risk of litigation claims for a wrongful termination. and. We strongly disagree with the proponents that this doesn't force union recognition. Under the successor employer doctrine at the federal level, it states that if a subsequent employer comes in and hires the majority of a prior employer's employees and that prior employer is unionized, you have to recognize the incumbent union and begin to immediately negotiate with them on a collective bargaining agreement. And by doing this through legislation, by forcing the subsequent employer to hire these employees through legislation, they're forcing a union relationship onto a potentially non-union employer without going through the proper election procedures set forth under the National Labor Relations Act. So we do think this is going to increase uh, private employers' costs, which ultimately does bear on the economy and harms our economy even further by putting additional costly mandates on the private sector. And for those reasons, we're opposed. Thank you. Next, please. Madam Chair, members, Matthew Hargo with the California Business Properties Association here today representing the Building Owners and Managers Association of California, International Council of Shopping Centers, NAOP of California, and a coalition of over 100 associations and businesses. We strongly oppose this bill. Bottom line is, is that this bill forces private companies to hire certain individuals. That's going to hurt the economy. That's going to hurt these companies. And we urge you to vote no on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Madam, Chair, members. With, sorry, oh, Madam Chair, members, John Hanley with the California Independent Grocers Association, also in opposition. Randy Knott with the California Hotel and Lodging Association in opposition for the reasons already stated. Megan Loper on behalf of the California Hospital Association in opposition. Chris McKaylee on behalf of the California Grocers Association, also in opposition. 
Madam Chair, Steve Carlson for the Apartment Associations of Greater Los Angeles, San Diego, and Santa Barbara in opposition. Thank you. Greg DeGere with the ARC and United Cerebral Palsy. We have withdrawn our opposition and we're neutral now and we thank Mr. Solario for the amendments to avoid hurting people with disabilities. And you're representing who? The ARC and United Cerebral Palsy, the Developmental Disabilities Group. Thank you. Thank you. Any other testimony for or against the bill? Any others? Uh, finance, do you have a file on this? Madam Chair, we are opposed to the bill because it would limit an employer's ability to select the most competitive candidate. All righty, members. Um, any other comments? All righty, Senator Alquist. Good day. Good day. Is there uh, drug testing for janitors? You know, that, that is one clarification I, I wanted to make. Nothing in this bill uh, precludes the successor employer from doing background checks or drug tests. In fact, in some industries, like in the security industry, uh, it's often the requirement as, as part that's, of new employment. That's very important, and yes. I'm glad, glad that's in your bill. Thank you. Thank you. And I move the bill. Thank you, Senator Alquist. Any other comments, members? Uh, let me just say, uh, I support the bill. In the city of San Diego years ago, I left the city council in 2000, we had a similar discussion about turnover and contractors at the stadium. The ballpark wasn't built then, but similar kind of large uh, public operations. And um, uh, I was supportive then and I'm still supportive. And especially in this economic climate to uh, put a, a low or way worker out of work with little or no notice, I think is, is uh, uh, a very poor idea in California and will only add to our unemployment woes. And I think that one of the things we can do to boost our economy is to let workers have a more stable work future. Uh, I don't think a 60 day uh, time out between contractors is a burden. So I just can't get there, I support the bill. We have a motion, uh, if there's no other comments. And there is a technical amendment uh, that's mentioned on uh, the page two of the analysis, it's uh, not a big one. Uh, we'll call the roll. Kehoe? Aye. Kehoe, aye. Walters? No. Walters, no. Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Emerson? No. Emerson, no. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Pavley? Price? Aye. Price, aye. Runner? No. Runner, no. Steinberg? Four uh, to three. Mr. Solario, you need five votes. Thank you, Senator. Uh, you need five, five votes total. One more. Okay. <laughs> And uh, next we have uh, Mr. Amiano. Uh, this is AB664. Um, and this is a suspense candidate, members. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Amiano. Thank members, you very much. I, I'll just say we are aiming to be on the floor at noon. Uh, we only have a couple of more uh, items to take up for a vote, so we're gonna move quickly. Thank you. Okay, subito, subito. Madam Chair and members, AB664 would create more than 20,000 jobs, 8,000 new units of housing with 30% set aside for low and moderate income families and will generate billions in economic activity by authorizing financing plans for special waterfront districts that include the waterfront areas in the city designated as America Cup venues, including certain lands on former Naval Station Treasure Island. AB664 would permit the city to create infrastructure finance districts, IFDs, at America Cup venue sites using the city's educational revenue augmentation fund, ERAF, share generated in the infrastructure finance district for the limited use of financing or refinancing of the waterfront. IFDs do not increase taxes, rather they rely on increases in the property tax base within the IFD. Before the city may authorize the formation of the IFD, the iBank must find a reasonable probability that the economic activity generated by the America's Cup in the IFD would result in an increase of revenue to the state general fund from sources such as sales taxes and income taxes generated by new businesses. This is greater than the amount of ERF. An economic impact study by the Bay Area Council's Economic Institute and Beacon Economics released in July 2010 concludes that if San Francisco is chosen to host the America's Cup in, 2000, in 2013, it would generate nearly 9,000 jobs and 1.4 billion in direct spending in the San Francisco Bay Area and California and nearly 1.9 billion nationwide. 
A fiscal impact study of the, T of the Treasure Island project shows a net increase in state revenues of more than 300 million over the 20 year build out period. The project would create 9,440 annual construction jobs and 2,900 long term jobs, along with 2,400 units of permanent affordable <laughs> housing for the Bay Area. Very good, Mr. Amiano. Do you want to hear from your witnesses? Yes, please. Thank uh, you. I would just say the, uh, the ERAF backfill uh, in both cases is a significant. Uh, 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 action in the general fund. So that's our concern. If you want to address the fiscal issues briefly, that would be the best thing. I'm Brad Benson, representing the Port of San Francisco, Chairperson Kehoe, and members of the committee. We appreciate your consideration of the bill today. Assemblymember Amiano talked about the Beacon Study, the America's Cup. Uh, is going to provide significant short-term benefits to the state's general fund that we project at $65 million over the course of the next two years, a period where we're still suffering to get out of the recession in California. Um, uh, we've taken a look at the staff analysis and we appreciate Mr. McKenzie's uh, work on this. Uh, we will recalculate based on the new sales tax rate that he's showing in the report, the 3.94% sales tax rate. Um, uh, we believe that the bill has a built-in mechanism to protect the general fund, which is that the iBank will review the actual tax benefits to the state from the America's Cup, and those tax benefits have to exceed the net present value of the ERAF share that the bill would provide to the city. Um, uh, and frankly, the America's Cup is not a done deal. Uh, I want to be clear that we were awarded rights to do CEQA analysis and other analysis of bringing the America's Cup to the state of California, uh, but the event authority and America's Cup race management won't decide until uh, the end of December this year whether or not to bring uh, the America's Cup to California. So are there, are there other competing cities? Um, you know, frankly, uh, uh, we don't know. Uh, there were, in December of 2012, an, an Italian city, Newport, was competing. I think the, the, the decision point at this point will be whether or not the city uh, has put together a, an economic package that includes All over right. 100 we, million. Okay. We thought Mr. Ellison was bringing it to San Francisco, unless I'm wrong. Is that right, Mr. Amiano? Uh, in private conversations I've had with him on his yacht, no, I, <laughs> Mr. Romeo, we assume there is a commitment based on conversation and contracts. You travel in such elite circles, I can only hope to admire from a distance. Try our Muni, try our Muni one time. Okay. <laughs> All righty, next please. Uh, good morning, Chair Kehoe, committee members, Michael Timoff in the San Francisco Mayor's Office. I'll speak briefly on the Treasure Island component of AB 664. We will also work with staff to revise the analysis um, that has been done with respect to the ERAF share. Uh, this is a tremendous economic development opportunity and job creations project. Um, as Amiano mentioned, over 2,000 annual construction jobs and 3,000 long-term permanent jobs will be created through this project. Um, with respect to the ERAF component of this bill, our projections looked at the development um, period, the 20-year period uh, project build-out, which projects that $300 million approximately would go to the state, $100 million would be diverted from the ERAF. We will look at the 45-year period as well as the reductions in um, the state tax revenues and work with staff to get you a revised analysis. But again, uh, this project has been through the most extensive and exhaustive public planning process in San Francisco. We recently yeah, made this shift from, good. from we, redevelopment to IFD. I uh, think we've got a good idea of that, how much goes into that. Anything else? Really, if you, if you have a well, point. I just want to say one more, one more thing, that AB 664 allows this project to move forward for the state to realize economic development opportunities and job creation tax revenue in the short term. Without it, we reopen the project to the entitlement risk. Um, there's an enormous public benefits package that's been negotiated over the years. Uh, if AB 664 doesn't go forward, we restart that process. Senator Emerson, do you have a comment? Or are you yeah. are you competing? Is that it? No, no, no. I'm yeah. not. I'm, I'm from the inland, South, Southern <laughs> California. But uh, if they want to do it with wind, we'll do that. I, I just wanted to ask uh, the author here. Just two months after we eliminated that evil <laughs> RDA, you're asking us to do a special RDA for San Francisco and asking our general fund to back fill education. Is that? Correct. No, I, 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 IFT is a is a different animal, Mr. Benson. If you wanted to explain it, well, 
I think in both cases, both portions of the bill have the same IBank test that guarantees a, a net benefit to the state general fund. Uh, the uh, the bill is a suspense candidate, and the EREF uh, backfill is certainly uh, one of our areas of interest. So we are open to more information on that, and we'll be working in, with staff in the meantime. You understand uh, we'll deliver our uh, outcomes on the suspense file on Thursday. On right. Thursday. Uh, so without object, oh, we need to hear from finance. Madam Chair, we are opposed to the bill unless it's amended to eliminate the portions of the bill that deal with Treasure Island. Uh, we understand the uh, economic arguments related to the America's Cup portion of it, but we do view that the Treasure Island piece is an attempt to uh, circumvent the RDA process itself, and those discussions in terms of where we want to go as a state on IFDs have not taken place, and this could set some precedents for future development that we don't want to set. Very good. Any other comments, members? So Mr. Amiata, we'll work with you while it's on suspense. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Mr. Blumenfield, and then Mr. Hernandez, and then we'll take up the uh, suspense items, members, and we should be able to make our, make our deadline. So Mr. Blumenfield, it's incumbent upon you to be succinct. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Welcome. Chair. Welcome, whenever you're ready. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair, members. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to present AB 1215. Uh, during my time in the State Assembly, I've, I've had a focus of trying to move us into the 21st century with a number of bills ranging from digital textbooks, online education, in various facets. This bill falls along those lines. Uh, it helps move us into the 21st century. It's good for taxpayers, car dealers, consumers, and anyone who doesn't like long lines at the DMV, which I imagine is most of us. I move the bill. Well. <laughs> You have um, there a, a great opening. Uh, Senator Alquist moves the bill. Will uh, looks like you have quite a bit of testimony. So we, um, if you want to finish your opening statement briefly, we'll take uh, a couple of speakers and then we'll just hear positions on the re remainder. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief then on the substance. Just to say that we've really built a unique coalition of folks who are often not together on issues uh, from the, the car yeah. dealers and the consumer groups, and it's been a, it's been a, a difficult process, but a very fruitful one. And I'm pleased to have this bill in front of you. I think it's a win-win-win-win, a four wins. All right, uh, Mr. Moss, see if you can top that. Don't please say five wins. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, members, Brian Moss with the California New Car Dealers Association. Uh, the only thing I'd refer to is the fiscal impact of the bill. Uh, it's a net positive fiscal impact. I suspect you're not going to see too many bills in this committee that have that effect. Uh, DMV is actually going to earn a minimum of $9 million per year. Uh, that's a, one of the unique uh, aspects of this bill. So uh, we join the broad coalition in supporting it and encourage you to vote aye today. Very good. Next, please. Madam Chair, members, first of all, I apologize for my attire, but uh, representing the used car dealers and we also support we think that you can't have enough disclosure, regardless of what it is. All righty, next please. Madam Chair, members, Rosemary Shahan, President of Consumers for Auto Reliability and Safety, and we welcome the opportunity to be on the same side with the car dealers supporting a consumer protection measure. And according to the U.S. Department of Justice, completion of the National Motor Vehicle Title Information System will save the American public between four and $11.3 billion a year by reducing auto theft, salvage fraud, and related crimes in California will benefit the most. We'd ask for your I vote. Thank you very much. Next, please. Madam Chair, well, Madam Chair members of the committee, James Lombard, on behalf of the California Motorcycle Dealers Association in support. Very good. We could have those couple chairs. If there's questions, we'll call you back. Madam Chair, Chris McKaylee on behalf of South Bay Expressway, and we're particularly interested as a toll operator in the state on the last provision reducing from six months to 90 days by which somebody can operate a vehicle without a license plate for, for, for toll evasion purposes. Thank you. Got, got it, thank you. Madam Chair, members, Crystal Jack on behalf of CarMax, also in support. Kevin Pedrotti representing CARCO in support of the bill. Very good, uh, that is testimony in favor. Any more testimony in favor? Is there opposition testimony? Finance? Madam Chair, I don't Is there opposition? Oh, come on up, Mr. Miller, sorry. Just uh... Madam Chair, George Miller on behalf of Carfax. 
Um, while we do believe that the author is, is very well intentioned in what he is trying to do here, we don't believe that Nimvitas is the way to get there. Nimvitas is currently in the marketplace and a competitor with entities such as my client Carfax and Experian. And the fact of the matter is dealers today choose not to buy the Nimvitas reports because they are inadequate in terms of providing the consumer protections and consumer knowledge about the vehicle's accident history. Nimvitas only deals with branded titles. They don't deal with accident history. Only if a vehicle has been declared a total loss vehicle will it show up in the Nimvitas report. No vehicle has ever been totaled because of safety reasons. It's only totaled by an insurance company if it costs more to repair than to replace. There are, there are several entities out there in the private sector to provide a complete data history, not only of branded titles, but of accidents, uh, whether airbags have gone off, frames have been damaged, straightened, you name it. Those things do not appear in the Nimvitas report, and it's our feeling that consumers are going to get a false sense of security based upon a very limited data set. Um, with that, we've been asking, and, we, and we'd hope that the legislature would see fit to allow the dealers to choose, as they are choosing now, they're choosing to pay more for data sets that are from entities other than Nimvitas because Nimvitas is incomplete. So what this bill does is mandate that the loser in the, in the free market system be mandated to be purchased by car dealers every time they sell a used vehicle. And we believe that if car dealers have a choice, that they will oftentimes choose the, the products that provide the consumer the okay. greatest So uh, this is the kind of benefit. crux of the opposition that the, there's these competing reports well, it's about what the consumer is going to get right. and, what, and whether they're going to be misled right, well, into believing a vehicle is safe a based upon a Let me more testimony on that. Is Certainly. that your issue also? Uh, yes, my name is Grace Lasser. And then uh, the author can respond briefly. And then we'll go to finance. Yeah. Our, our position is we're, we're not against the bill in totality. All we're asking and who are you for representing? Excuse Carfax. Me. Carfax. Free vehicle History Service. And, and the only thing we're asking is for the addition of four words that says Nimvitas or any commercial provider. Uh, the, the concept being that today dealers are using commercial providers when they buy a car at auction, when they take it uh, in at trade, and then when they retail the vehicle as well. And we, you know, all the commercial providers have the same information Nimvitas does. The key is the dealer's already doing that, so now he's being asked to charge a second, to pay a second time for the exact same data. And we're just saying add four words so that dealers have a choice. Run Nimvitas, don't, don't remove the disclosure requirement, don't remove the mandate, just say run an Vetus or a commercial provider in order to comply with the mandate. That, that's the only thing we're asking. Okay, next please. Madam Chair, Paul Gladfelty on behalf of Experian, which also owns AutoCheck, which is a similar service. Our concerns are the same, and I, I know um, you're short on time here, but again, it's really about choice. Uh, we don't believe that uh, a report like Nimvitas, which is not a complete report, as complete as a, uh, either Carfax or AutoCheck, uh, should be excluded by law. So with, with that, we're opposed to the bill on that provision. Thank you. Next, please. Madam Chair and members, I'm Malachi Amen, President of the California Urban Partnership, also here on behalf of the Sacramento Urban League. Uh, we're concerned about this bill given the rise of used car sales and the implications for struggling families, struggling micro businesses that might buy a used car and not be able to rely on the information and then be stuck with a car that uh, they could have avoided purchasing in the first place. So for those reasons, we're opposed. John Caldwell, on behalf of R.L. Polk, um, we would uh, urge the, uh, the amendment that was described by Carfax. The choice. The, uh, and uh, unopposed if that amendment is not taken. And you're opposed if it's not taken, right? Okay, just so I hear you. Yes, sir. Hi, Michael Saragosa on behalf of Hispanic 100 and Latin Business Association, also in opposition. Uh, we would uh, support if uh, the amended four words were in the bill. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Blumenfield on the, the choice issue. Okay, a couple, a couple things. Nothing in this bill prevents dealers from purchasing Carfax or, or individuals or any of these other services. They're good services. They give you a lot of information. This bill basically says, it speaks to putting the salvage sticker on and says if, it, if, you, if you come up in the Nvidia system, you put the salvage sticker on. Why Nvidia? Because as, as a government, I don't think we should be picking and choosing among commercial enterprises. The Nvidia is a federally mandated uh, database that's 
run, author uh, 1992 law and federal anti-car theft law that mandates that we create this database and that this nonprofit organization run the database. It is the only database that all insurance companies are required by federal law to report all of their information to when the car when a car has been in an accident and that kind of thing. All these private commercial services are good services, but they're not required by federal law to have um, this information reported to. So if you're buying a car, you should probably get, you know, you, you, you see if you get that salvage sticker, but you can also purchase these other other services. Thank you, Mr. Bloomfield. One, one very last point, which okay. is, while these good services that have testified may be great services, there's nothing, if we were to put that amendment on, for some rogue company to come by and offer a very shoddy service, uh, because there's no control over what is a commercial entity that's, that's worthwhile. All righty. Uh, we are going to hear from uh, finance. Madam Chair, I don't have an approved position on this version. However, we were neutral on an earlier version. You were uh, what? Neutral on an neutral earlier on version. Neutral on an earlier version. Uh, members, are there any uh, comments on the bill? This is a due pass. Oh, uh, Senator it. Price. Yeah, I appreciate the, uh, the efforts of the author and uh, putting the other uh, disparate group of organizations to, uh, to support it. But back on the issue of, of choice and, and again, the, uh, the downside or your hesitancy of including other commercial services, you say because you can't really um, uh, make a judgment on the quality of, of these potential other services that uh, it would be uh, disadvantageous to the public to include that? That, that's part of it. The services are certainly, I mean, other services will be certainly contracted out for, but in terms of requiring the Navitas database, it is a federally required, it is it's the only one that federal government requires all of this reporting to. So I don't know how we distinguish and allow other services that don't have the federal requirements on to, um, to substitute in. Nothing prevents a commercial service from getting the Navitas in data <clears throat> and offering that service. The bill, the amendment on June 5th, on the 15th, allows for a commercial entity to take the place of Navitas as long as they have the Navitas data. But what what what's being asked of us is to ask is to allow for any commercial entity to to come out without the Navitas data. And the Navitas data is important because it's federally mandated. Okay. Uh, Okay, uh, let, let's, uh, I'm gonna hear from senators first. If we go back to witnesses, if we go back to witnesses, I'll hear from you two very briefly, that's it. Uh, just because of our time. So, uh, Senator Alquist and then Senator Emerson. And anyone else uh, on the committee that wants to speak, let me know. Thank you, uh, I understand why you're using Invitas and you seem to have great support for it. Um, I've always, though, been supportive of choices and nothing that really looks like single source, so to speak. And I just wonder, following on what Senator Price said, if there isn't a way just to put a sentence in the bill that simply says something like uh, car purchasers are encouraged to, you know, to also consider other, whatever the phrase, you know, would be. Commercial service. That's it. If I could just add on to that and then I'll go to Senator Emerson. I don't know if the author would consider Navitas and, and, and something else rather than something else instead of Navitas. Would that help with the opposition? I'm not sure. But, you know, I could maybe go that far. But Senator Emerson, uh, let's hear from you. Well, I, I do have I do have some concerns. I understand the Invitas in, information is is an absolute requirement, but I think I, I think uh, potential buyers should be advised that it's not a complete history of the vehicle, and that they that they should be encouraged to look at some other information if they want to make a purchase of an automobile, or the commercial vendors should use Invitas as part of their uh, of their. Uh, uh, plan, so uh, I'd like to see something of that nature. Mm -hmm. and, and nothing in this bill makes it seem like this is the be all and end all of the day. All it does is if it's the trigger for the but, salvage sticker. But I, understand that, but, I, but I also think that if somebody has uh, some approval by that's required by the federal government, they may think it's a, a complete 
history of that car, and I, I, don't, I don't believe it is a complete history of the maintenance of the vehicle and other things of that nature, so I'm just. Right, it's, it's very clear, this is just about the title of the car, that's all, that's what this is about. Members, are there still questions about Senator Price, additional questions? Uh, or commercial data provider uh, just makes it more more inclusive. Um, yeah, I, I I can't go either or. The Navita should be included. You want more? I'm okay with that, but not less. So that's that's where I'm at, and I think that's very important. And we'll just go back down the row very briefly one more time. But remember, consumers under our analysis benefit by this, and I'm I'm that's important to me. Mr. Moss, and then we'll go down the line. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, I want to clarify a couple points. Dealers today under existing law are required to tell consumers if a vehicle has been salvaged. What AB 1215 does is set up for the first time a procedure by which dealers will check a database to determine whether or not a vehicle has been salvaged. The database they're going to check is the only one mandated by the federal government. Uh, it's much like the federal census. It's you get information in that database, it's just a database. You can add to the database, you can supplement it, you can uh, provide additional information, but it's one place to go where federal law requires salvage companies, junk companies, insurance companies, and all 50 DMVs to report information. It's not 100% complete, no database is, but it's a great place to start. Language in the bill presently. So what about, oh, what about another report? Well. What this does is it only deals with title information. Okay. The other reports, Carfax, other vendors provide additional information about accidents, vehicle history, repair information. That's good information. A lot of our dealers purchase those reports and no doubt will continue to purchase the reports. But the narrow purpose of this bill is to put notices on vehicles so that consumers understand when they go to a dealer and they buy a car that's been identified in Nimvitas, they know they better ask some more questions about that vehicle. That's the narrow scope okay. of this provision. Let's go to the next witness then, and then Mr. Miller. Right, we're strongly in support of requiring Nimvitas for a number of reasons. One is that the information tends to be much more timely. All the entities that have to report to that database have to update their data at least every 30 days, and a lot of them are updating it daily, and it's the most important, vital information for consumers to get. What we would hope and what the Department of Justice has been asking Carfax and Experian to do is to incorporate the NIMBITAS data into their database and become a data provider like their competitors. That's what they really should do, Alrighty. and they haven't been doing that. Mr. Miller, one last comment. Yes, um, thank you. Nimbitas has been around in existence for 19 years, and there's 19 states yet left to be com providing the complete data to, to Nimbitas. If, if anyone should get, need a complete source of data, Nimbitas ought to contract with Carfax or Experian to get it. We get our data from the states. We get our data from the state DMV every week, and they and they provide it like clockwork because every time they provide it, we send them a check. Every single state in the union and every province of Canada and the District of Columbia provides our data as fast as they can because every time they do it, we give them a check. What this is, what they've done, and Vetus has done, is say, we mandate that you give it to us. And Illinois has said, we're not participating. 19 years, and not one thing has happened to the state of Illinois. What about all those cars that were flooded in Illinois this spring? They come to California. It's not going to show up on the Nimbitas report, but it'll show up on a Carfax report. Alrighty. All right, members. Uh, Mr. Liu. Uh, so um, it appears there are very different views of which database is better. That's a policy issue I, that I can't decipher at this point in time, but I'll vote for it for fiscal reasons, and then I'll, on the floor, I would like to have more information uh, on the two, on the various competing policy views. Thanks. All right, uh, members, I, 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 think that, I think this is a good bill. Uh, Mr. Blumenfield has wide support in the industry amongst consumers, used cars, and new cars, correct? Correct. So, you know, the, the other products that are available to consumers are probably good co products, but Mr. Blumenfield's bill is about pulling in a national database so consumers can see a clear red sticker if they've got maybe 
potentially purchasing a problem vehicle. I'm prepared to support it. I've sort of lost track of things. Do we have a motion on this one? I move the bill. I'm, I'm prepared to support it. I do suggest, though, that the author consider maybe just a sentence that would say that it, this is just not the end all be mm -hmm. all and that consumers, it's their responsibility Alrighty. to check other sources. Thank you, Senator Alquist. Uh, Senator Alquist moves the bill, call the roll. Oh, did we hear from finance? Yes. We were neutral on a previous You're version. neutral. Okay. Call the roll, please. Kehoe? Aye. Kehoe, aye. Walters? Aye. Walters, aye. Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Emerson? Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Pavley? Aye. Pavley, aye. Price? Aye. Price, aye. Runner? Aye. Runner, aye. Steinberg? Aye. Steinberg, aye. All righty. We're going to go to Mr. Hernandez. Uh, that, that bill is out, 8 to 0. Uh, 1292, Mr. Hernandez, as briefly as you can possibly make it. And then, members, we have to take up all the suspense items. Go ahead. Good morning. Good uh, morning. Madam Chairwoman and Senators, uh, this is a good news bill. It gives the state of California an opportunity to draw down federal dollars uh, to improve our state's drinking water and drinking water infrastructure by granting authority to the California Department of Public Health uh, the ability to sell revenue bonds in order to receive the federal funding to invest in the water infrastructure projects. I'm asking for your consideration to support this project. Uh, the feds have doubled the amount that they're giving the state of California. This gives us the opportunity by drawing down the funds to capitalize on that and those dollars. Move the bill. Thank you. Uh, Senator Walters, I think, whispered it ahead of time. Uh, so we'll go to your witnesses. Go right ahead. Good morning. Thank you. This I am Leah Walker. I'm chief of the Division of Drinking Water and Environmental Management in the Department of Public Health. And I, in the interest of time, I will um, not go through my remarks. I think the, uh, the assembly member has summarized it well, and I'm here to answer any technical Very questions good. you have. Good morning, Cindy Tuck with the Association of California Water Agencies. Aqua supports the bill. Thank you, Ms. Tuck. Members, uh, we have a motion. Any questions? Seeing none, uh, we'll hear from finance, and then we'll call the roll. I don't have a position on All the All righty, call the roll, please. Kehoe? Aye. Kehoe, aye. Walters? Aye. Walters, aye. Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Emerson? Aye. Emerson, aye. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Pavley? Aye. Pavley, aye. Price? Aye. Price, aye. Runner? Aye. Runner, aye. Steinberg? Aye. Steinberg, aye. Nine to zero, that bill is out. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you. Uh, do we have a couple of outstanding bills? Two bills on call. Two. Members, let's take up the on call bills and then we'll go down those items that are going to suspense. The, fir the first item on call is Mr. Hagman's AB 135. Uh, the chair is no, the vice chair is aye. Call the absent members. Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Pavley? Aye. Pavley, aye. Price? No. This is Hagman, one, uh, oh. AB 135. I okay, bill. hold it, hold Sorry. it, hold it. Chair, I be chair. To the pro tem. Let, let me see the other one, please. <laughs> chair, Bam. chair no, vice chair aye. Yes. Call the absent Bam. members. I voted no on committee, Bam. so thank you. Yes. Call, uh, let's just go down the whole yeah. roll call then. <laughs> members, if we could please pay attention. We got about two minutes to get to the floor. Kehoe? Kehoe, no. Kehoe, no. Walters? Aye. Walters, aye. Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Emerson? Emerson, aye. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Pavley? No. Pavley, no. Price? No. Price, no. Runner? Aye. Runner, aye. Steinberg? No. Steinberg, no. Five to four, the bill is out. <clears throat> And next is uh, Mr. Solario, AB 350. Uh, this is members, AB 350. Chair, I, Vice Chair, no. Please call the absent members. Sorry, which one? AB 350, okay. Mr. Solario, yep. displaced uh, janitors. Yep. Pavley? Pavley? No. Chair? Uh, that this is, the, this is AB 350, yes, the chair is I, the okay. vice chair is no. And, right. But, okay. And so you're not voting? At the moment. Okay. Steinberg. Steinberg, I. Steinberg, I. Uh, I'm prepared to close the roll. That is five ayes, three noes, and the bill is out. Uh, who else have we got here? Mr. Perea didn't present. Okay, okay. Uh, have we finished? 
Um, we're going back to the top of the file. Mr. Portentino, AB2. Mr. Portentino, AB2. Members, we're gonna take up all the items that are headed to the suspense file. If members of the audience wanna to speak to the bill, they need to come forward when I call uh, the, name, the number of the bill. This is AB2, post-secondary education by Mr. Portentino. All those in favor, uh, please come forward to testify. Is there opposition testimony? Finance, do you have a comment on this? We're opposed to a previous version. The item goes to suspense. AB 152 by Mr. Fuentes. Members of the public, food bank, voluntary contributions. Uh, are you in favor? Yes, Kathy right. Mossberg representing the food banks in support and we'll work with the staff to get it off. All righty, anybody else in favor of AB 152? Dave Puglia, Western Growers Association in support. All righty, anyone else on AB 152? Is there opposition? Finance? We're opposed to a previous version. The item goes to suspense. Next is uh, Assembly Member Calderon, Use Tax Retailer Business, AB 155. This is a suspense item. Those in favor, please come forward. Uh, Lenny Goldberg, California Tax Reform Association. We've testified on this issue many times. Uh, for or against? Oh, oh, in support. In support. Also in support, Chris McKaylee on behalf of the California Grocers Association. All righty. Is there opposition testimony? AB 155, opposition. The item goes to suspense. Uh, Ms. Brownlee's been dispensed with, Mr. Solario. Uh, Ms. Lowenthal has two items, AB 615, high-speed rail. Is there testimony in favor? Testimony in favor on this bill? Seeing none, is there opposition testimony? Finance, do you have a comment? No file on this one. Uh, that goes to suspense. AB 1099, motor vehicle emissions. Uh, is there testimony in favor? Is there opposition testimony? Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, Brooks Allison on behalf of the California Dump Truck Owners Association, the construction trucking industry. Um, that, it's, the current amendment is inconsistent with the deal that was reached in the policy committee. As your staff points out, it is unworkable. It's also unfair to an industry that's devastated by 50% unemployment and having their trucks and, and houses uh, foreclosed in bankruptcy. We have to stay on suspense. Any other, thank you, Mr. Ellison. Any other testimony for or against? Finance. No file. All righty, uh, that item goes to suspense. Mr. Amiano's America's Cup has been uh, in suspense. Mr. Perez, economic development, AB 109. M folks in favor, come forward. Very briefly, Mr. Perez. Very briefly. Well, AB 901, Madam Chair, codifies the California Small Business Development Centers and requires a yearly report to the governor and appropriate legislative policy so, committees. Uh, the bill also updates terms and makes clarifications to assist the implementation of the Federal and State Small Business Act of 2010, which are delivering millions of dollars in technical assistance and credit opportunities for small business. I respectfully ask for your vote. Thank you. Witnesses? Madam Chair, members, Kristen Johnson, California Small Business Development Center, and I'm uh, in support of this bill. Uh, the Small Business Development Center program serves over 50,000 businesses each year. The, California is the only state in the nation that does not have uh, a, a formal relationship between the state and this federally funded program. Additionally, while we appreciate money from the state, uh, this bill is not asking for funds and there is an existing administrative structure uh, with our program that produces regional and state reports and that will uh, save the state between 100 and $150,000 annually by using the existing structure. Very good, next please. My name is Paul Stokes, uh, a small business owner for 13 years here. Uh, where, where, where about are you from, Mr. Stokes? Sacramento. Oh. And I uh, have used the services of the Small Business Development Center for probably the last seven to eight years. Uh, and without their services through the highs and lows of the economy, uh, I doubt I'd still be here today. And uh, definitely in favor. Thank you. Very good. Next, please. Uh, Priscilla Lopez, Regional Director for the Orange County Inland Empire Small Business Development Center Network, representing Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties, and in favor of this bill. Very good. Now we'll take people's name and position on the bill. And so just, and we'll take all three seats, please. Go right ahead, ma'am. Uh, Diane Howerton, Regional Director, UC Merced. 
uh, Small Business Development Center covering all of Central California. So Thank I you support this bill. In support. Thank you. Debbie Trujillo with the San Diego and Imperial SBDC Network, and we are in support of this bill. Welcome. Dan Ripke, Regional Director, Northeastern California Small Business Development Centers from Stockton to the Oregon border, and I'm in support of this bill. Big territory. Yes, sir. Bob Giudevine covering the Northern California SBDC Network, uh, Bay Area, Silicon Valley. Very good. Next, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jesse Torres, Regional Director at Los Angeles Small Business Development Center Network, servicing Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties in support of the bill. Good morning, Sean Snyder, Orange County Inland Empire Regional Small Business Development Center Network, serving Orange County, San Bernardino, and Riverside counties in support of the bill. Next. Richard Harmon, Townsend Public Affairs, on behalf of the California Association for Microenterprise Opportunity in support of the bill. Yolanda Benson, representing the California Asian Pacific Chamber of Commerce, also representing the California Association of Enterprise Zones. Small business is important to both of those organizations, and we support the bill. Malachi Amen of the California Urban Partnership and our partnering community development corporations across the state in support of the bill. Thank you. Next, please. Rena Ventry, on behalf of the Association of Financial Development Corporations, we're in support. All righty. Next, please. Dale Shimasaki, Long Beach Community College, in support. Very good. Any other testimony in favor of the bill? Is there opposition testimony? Finance, do you have a comment? I have a preliminary analysis that identifies a $6 million cost pressure. I don't have a position on the bill. All righty. Members, uh, this is a suspense candidate, so uh, we'll work with the author while it's on suspense. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Thank you, Mr. Sanders. Perez. And then the final item is Mr. Perez, AB 1424. Oh, Perea, Perea, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, franchise Tax Board Delinquent Tax Debt, and we've got some incoming revenues with this one, Mr. Perea, so yes. you, you get a prize. There, All I right. think there's only two this morning. <laughs> this well, is a suspense candidate. I will be very brief since I know we all have to be on the floor now. Um, Madam Chair and Senators, thank you for the opportunity to present AB 1424. It's designed to increase the collection of delinquent, delinquent taxpayer debt in California. The only thing I'll highlight, because um, in your analysis you, you have uh, all, the, uh, all the details of what the bill will do, is that it is estimated that AB 1424, if it were enacted, the state would collect over $140 million in the next five years. And so I respectfully ask for your eye vote. Thank you. Testimony? Uh, yes, Lenny Goldberg, California Tax Reform Association. A number of these things were tried with regard to collection of child support, and they worked extremely well. We have supported bills, and this committee has, that go broader than this bill. It's a modest effort, but does the right thing in terms of tax collection. Next, please. Thank you. Jessica Barthlow, Western Center on Law and Poverty. We support this bill. In a year of hard decisions, this shouldn't be one. Bringing home tax money that has already been um, levied against individuals who haven't paid it in order to prevent further cuts is something that we support and we think all Californians should. Thanks. Very good. Any other testimony on AB 1424? Uh, finance uh, for or against? Is there opposition testimony to AB 1424? Finance, do you have a comment? We were neutral on a previous version. You're neutral on the bill. Okay, it goes to suspense. Great. Mr. Perea, thank, thank you. you. Sorry. Okay. I, uh, you're tall, dark, and handsome, and I just, I guess you got you mixed up. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Uh, members, I think we're finished with the file. Anybody that has to cast a vote? Uh, so um, that concludes the file, and uh, we're adjourned. See everybody. Hey.